Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to land on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Just like aliens visiting from another world. It had been the stuff of science fiction. Now, everything that could be imagined seemed possible. In 2002, the Mars Odyssey spacecraft detected enormous reservoirs of ice beneath the Martian surface. The presence of ice and the possibility of water suggested that life could be sustained or even generated on another planet. After decades of orbiting space shuttles and robotic rovers, the idea of sending man back into space, to Mars and beyond, ignited the imagination. Einstein's big idea was that the amazing speed of light holds the key to everything, from the untold power of the atom to the possibility of time travel. Welcome to the realm of time travel. It turns out that if an object is moving fast enough through space, it can alter its passage through time. If Bertrand's ship had some suitable equipment, we could see this mysterious effect for ourselves. This device is a light clock, two mirrors that face each other with a particle of light, or photon, bouncing between them. And in the right hands, such a clock shows directly how speed changes time. These ticks would normally occur millions of times per second, but we have slowed it down to show how this clock works and how the motion of it will affect the rate of ticking. You'll notice that the clock is ticking more slowly as I move it. Why is that? Well, the photon is making a zigzag path to reach one mirror and then the other. That's a longer path that the photon has to take. And that means that it takes more time to make that path. So the clock is slowing down. 
This is where physics and science fiction collide. Time for the moving clock runs slow, although if you travel with it, like Bertrand, you're not aware of the change. That's because everything happening on board, including your heartbeat and your brain waves, would slow down by the same amount. The faster Bertrand travels, the further the photon has to go between ticks, and the slower time passes for him. So what might be an hour for Bertrand could be a hundred years for the rest of us. In effect, he would be traveling a hundred years into the future. Would we actually be able to get back to the exact place that we want to, or would we end up in deep space? Well, time is like a river. Mm -hmm. That the river of time may have whirlpools. We think that the river of time may fork into two rivers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the catch is you have to be what we call a type 3 civilization, capable of manipulating the power of a black hole, the power of a star. Mm -hmm. Space and time is a fabric. We can bend the fabric of space-time. We measure this in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. We measure this around stars. But to rip, to rip the fabric of space-time, that would require the energy of something like a black hole. When we physicists look in outer space for alien life, we don't look for little green men. We look for type 1, type 2, and type 3 civilizations. A type 1 civilization has harnessed planetary power. They control earthquakes, the weather, volcanoes. They have cities on the ocean. Anything planetary, they control. That's type 1. A type 2 civilization is stellar. They've exhausted the power of a planet, and they get their energy directly from their mother star. They just don't get a suntan on a weekend. They use solar flares. They use the power of the sun itself to energize their huge machines. Eventually, they exhaust the power of a star, and they go galactic. They harness the power of billions of stars within a galaxy. Now, for example, Buck Rogers would correspond to a Type I civilization, a planetary civilization. Star Trek and the Federation of Planets, who have colonized a few star systems, would correspond to a Type II system. And the Empire of Star Wars would correspond to a Type III civilization. Now, what are we on this scale? We are Type Zero. We don't even rate on this scale. We get our energy from, not from stars or galaxies, we get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But we can calculate when we will attain type 1 status, in about a hundred years. idea that you could write a program and have this machine do all this complicated stuff, mm -hmm. that you could actually start building your own DNA. Once we have the manual and once we have the ability to program mm -hmm. these cells, what sorts of things do you think we could do? So we have, so what can living systems do? They can make any kind of organic molecule you could ever want, from a biofuel to a flavonoid to a drug to whatever. Um, they can make materials, like they can make uh, wood. Using DNA, using molecules, mm -hmm. using cells, you could create, and you in fact are creating, machines, mm -hmm. biological machines. Um, there are scientists who want to understand life, and then there are engineers who want to understand life by building it, by recapitulating it, right? And that's just amazing. That's awesome. Cloning will be a completely new way of making a human being. Instead of the combination of father's sperm and mother's egg that makes each of us unique, cloning will create a baby from a single cell, from a single person. The clone will be an identical genetic copy.
yourself in the shoes of a NASA scientist planning a manned trip to Mars. It's a journey that will take years. Among the algorithms and telemetries is a simple yet nagging problem. How do you feed your astronauts? On long-term space flights, it's uh, impossible to pack enough freeze-dried meals and carry all of that weight for the long term of the endeavor. So it's, it's important to grow the food that uh, the crew will need. Makes sense. But how would you do that? Where's the dirt? And what do you grow? In this chamber, we have some mini tuber potatoes that were planted in here about a week ago. And you can readily see how much growth we've got during that time. You can uh, see the formation of the stems, the roots. Very nice root development in one week's time. In 1995, the potato was the first food ever grown in orbit, using a technology called aeroponics. Unlike hydroponics, which submerges a portion of the plant in water, aeroponics concentrates a small mist of nutrients onto the plant suspended in air. for less than half a million years and yet we know that the average shelf life of a species is maybe one to ten million years so maybe we have a rosy future ahead of us the future of our species is uncertain but our skills are unparalleled we know how to survive now we must add wisdom to that knowledge Today we are fast approaching the day when the body can no longer be regarded as fixed. Man will be able, within a reasonably short period, to redesign not merely individual bodies, but the entire human race. Yeah.